the north is north, the south is south, the twain shall never meet. Uh, let me uh, set the context. In the last uh, three years of this very long decade, we have seen the divisions quite visible in at least three instances of significant importance. The pandemic and the vaccine distribution, and you saw the division between the North and the South. Who had access to the vaccines? How soon did they have access? Uh, what was the agency and capacity of countries during the pandemic? Very visible. You had the Ukraine crisis and the countries that sanctioned Russia, the countries who stayed away from it, the countries who are building bridges and, and reintegrating um, uh, 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 Russia into their lives in different ways. You saw the division play out during the Ukraine crisis. And now, during the Middle East crisis, you see a similar pattern of the North and the South having a different assessment of what's happening, how things are unfolding, and what do they stand for or at least what is important from within a very large conflict, a long conflict, that they want to focus on. And I'm only listing three, then you add a few more. For example, uh, migration, a crisis migration in Europe of Europeans, and it is celebrated and they are welcomed and they are given hospitality. Crisis migration of others into Europe, and they are put into fences and cages, and treated quite shabbily. And, and the list is endless. Uh, I'm sure there's enough on the other side as well, and I'm not uh, blaming anyone here. The simple proposition to each one of you is, and I'm going to first have an opening round uh, of, of responses from each one of you. Can the two ever meet? Under what conditions? And, under what pur and, and for what purpose can the two meet? And I'm going to uh, start with uh, Elizabeth, and I'm going to come to Belina, then go to my friend uh, Anthony, uh, then Lynn, and finally Dino. That's the order of play. So let me start with you, Elizabeth. Can the two meet? What conditions? What purpose? Great. Thanks, uh, Samir. And in the, um, in the context of this evening where I think everybody has had a glass of wine, of course they do meet, and they meet at the equator. <laughs> but I think the more philosophical question that you, uh, that you pose is one that, to my mind, uh, is not something that can be achieved in the short term. Uh, that the examples you have given, as well as the ones that specifically relate to, to the continent, to Africa, where we are here at, at, at the bottom of the continent, uh, clearly highlight the, the huge divisions, that we, that the, the different ways in which we see the world. And I think a great, uh, a great analogy would be if you look at your bathtub and where the water, you know, if all of you who are from the northern hemisphere look at your bathtub today, this evening, and you see the way the water goes into the into the bath, uh, into the, the sink. Drain, into the sink. Uh, it's the complete opposite direction of the way in which it would be doing it in the north. And I think this reflects the different perspectives and the different understandings of of the world. Now, under what conditions? Because I think we do need to 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 meet each other. We do need uh, to to come together. I, I think it requires a significant mind shift and a recognition of the other. And in fact, I think we need to move beyond the other. One of the problems of today, which has become even more uh, 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 as accelerated is the polarization where it is about you and me. It's not about we, it's you, mm -hmm. it's us and them. And we see that also in the way in which uh, the the analysis of the two conflicts that you highlighted sort of play out. And I think the, the clear double standards in the way in which different conflicts are, are interpreted. And so the conditions are that we need a mindset shift of those that have previously dominated the narratives okay. and, and, and for the purpose of humanity because of the significant global challenges that we face and that we have to work together to resolve. Mindset, mind, mindset shift and a reassessment of how we view the world together. Uh, not easy, but I, I, that's, uh, that's a fair intervention. Let me turn to Velina. Can the two ever meet Velina? And Velina, let me acknowledge that you're the only one from the true global north here. And thank you for joining this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am indeed from the global north, but in fact, uh, given my background, coming from that corner of uh, the north that has seen a lot of... Uh, a lot of uh, animosities, military conflicts, uh, I tend to actually uh, mentally 
align with uh, with the south now let me present my um, two cents from of course from a geopolitical point of view and i uh, of course consider the big picture the 20 years 15 to 20 years uh, developments where i just don't see many points of intersection given the ongoing systemic processes now you've mentioned some of the key actually the key conflicts but if we go further um, and we've been talking about it in other formats uh, the fragmentation the fractures of this global order these are overwhelming processes and we are actually uh, in the middle of it. We are not uh, at the end of uh, this story. Mm -hmm. So while we are moving towards a new outcome, and of course we all want to hope that this outcome will be favor favorable to everyone, I think that uh, we're going, we are going to see more, more actually conflicts, more low intensity conflicts, which will last longer. So the Ukraine, the war in Ukraine, the Middle Eastern conflict, next uh, North Korea, uh, Taiwan issue, and all of these issues are going to further polarize the, the global the south, south versus the North. So where are we going to meet? I argue that we are going to meet once we have to set the new, the new rules of the game. Once when, unfortunately, there will be a big systemic clash most likely between United States on the one hand and Russia and China on the other hand, and all of the global south being in between, kind of further polarized, of course, because nobody wants to live in a binary world. We've seen this before, nobody liked it. So my hope, of course, is that there will be much bigger push from the global south to prevent this worst case scenario. And by doing so... So you're placing the owners of responsibility on the global south to fix the relationship? No, I'm placing the agency on the global south to not be instrumentalized like it happened before that. Because during the first Cold War, what happened was that the two main uh, superpowers decided actually how the rest of the world should uh, more or less align. Mm -hmm. And the, the, what we had in, the mid, you know, in between, and it was mentioned at the inauguration uh, today was of course the non-alignment movement. So my mm. question mark here is probably there will be something similar and here the question mark I have is are they going to meet in India again? Is India going to be a new kind of player that is going to create bridges between two impossible worlds? Uh, okay, it's more two impossible worlds. Than... Are we going to have India, Indonesia and others having to play a role that bridges? And I'm going to come back to that part. Is there a role for bridge powers or bridge actors who create linkages between these two warring factions. Uh, Anthony, so let me turn to you. Um, you've heard the previous uh, two interventions. Um, can, I, can, I, can I seek your response to the idea of, of their being able to meet and work together? Yeah, I, I, I like what I hear. I'm in agreement so far <laughs> with the idea that the twain will not meet anytime soon. Some people argue that, uh, that we are experiencing a global reset of the rules-based international world order. Mm -hmm. And therefore, all that we have to do as the global south is help adjust mm -hmm. so that the rules work better for all. I don't think that's what's going on. I think we're experiencing a very sharp rupture in terms of global order. A rupture, a break, a disillusion means damage, mm. conflict, uh, and repair that is necessary. This moment of rupture which we experience in front of our eyes this year or around this period now requires from us the courage to say how can we be responsible for co-creating a new future based on new rules, not readjusting the old rules-based world order. And so it's incumbent upon people like us and others in the global south to put forward some ideas. Let me quickly point out to a contradiction. We're expected to participate in the rules of the game as states, mm -hmm. as nation states. Mm -hmm. That concept, which comes from Western liberalism, sets us up against each other because mm -hmm. we all have national interests and security interests and self-interest, and we are pursuing them at the expense of others. Or we make alliances to better protect or advance our own interests. Is this the basis for creating or co-creating a new world order? I doubt it. I think we need to think with the audience, what other mechanism can we use to build conversations between North and South? One example, I'll conclude with this idea, 
is the idea of civilizational states. Mm -hmm. uh, there are examples in history of mature polities, political arrangements, that have foundational beliefs that are strong enough to make a vision of the ideal world order in a way that presents a viable alternative to Western liberalism. Hmm. I think we need to explore that. So, for example, uh, Ubuntu, Vasudeva Kutumbukum, uh, these are all ancient traditions coming from the folks who've been you around. You my mind. Exactly, exactly. The challenge, there are many challenges, mm -hmm. contradictions and shortcomings. For example, here in Africa, we want to believe, and Agenda 2063 of the African Union says the vision is a united, prosperous, confident uh, Africa, uh, a future co-determined by citizens, and an Africa that plays a role in international affairs, takes its rightful place. We are not there yet. Mm -hmm. That is a process or a project in the making. And one of the architects are with us tonight in the room. Mm -hmm. We need to take that idea forward. And allow me to say one last thing. <laughs> if we want to be bold and innovative, I can't see anybody here who is 18 or younger. We have to ask the youth to participate, not to sit in the chairs in the audience, but to be on the stage as well. Mm -hmm. if, we, if, if the youth says we're not interested in your political project, then we have to do self-introspection. Why is it that we're not carrying the yes. generation of tomorrow so, with us? So, so this very forum here doesn't do that. You know, I, I think that's a very important point. I'm done. By the time you invite them to the room, the youth have already made up their mind on Instagram. Because Instagram reaches them at 13 or 12 or 11, and we only invite them to these conferences at 25 or 30. So we have lost them by that time. And it's a very important point. And we must go down to the youth, to schools and to colleges to involve them in our processes. Okay, uh, Elizabeth made a point very early on, tongue in cheek, that North and South meet, they meet at the equator. So I'm going to now come to the equator, Singapore and Indonesia. Uh, is there where the North and South meet? Can they ever meet, Lynn, in your assessment? Well, I think we've heard a lot from the panel already about why um, North and South might not be meeting anytime soon. But I'd like to talk about why they must, why they must meet in a true meeting of equals and of minds. Um, I think currently, uh, it's fair to say that the global south has been clearly underrepresented in um, global decision making. And um, that I think is not just bad in terms of morally bad, it's just bad policy. Um, the global south constitutes about 85% of the world's population and almost 40% of the world's GDP. And its cooperation on global challenges is absolutely necessary, whether we're talking about pandemics or the, on, on, on climate change. Uh, I think the West also needs, as it's clear now, the global south uh, to uh, support and defend the rule of law, um, whether it's um, an unlawful invasion of a sovereign country or it's um, uh, pushing back against uh, unlawful and coercive Chinese actions in the South China Sea and elsewhere. So I think, you know, it's not, it's, it, we've talked about why the meeting of minds might not come anytime soon, but I think, you know, here's, those are the reasons why they must come. And you've talked about uh, conditions under which um, that meeting uh, yeah, could might happen. take place. And I think it requires changes both on the part of the North, but also of the South. In terms of the North, I think it's quite clear that, you know, it's historical, it, the history uh, its history with parts of the global South has been troubled to say the least. Um, there is rather little it can do about that, but let's talk about the present. And you already highlighted some instances where there has been clear negligence on the part of the North in terms of caring for uh, the problems and troubles of the South. And so the pandemic was one instance. It's uh, disregard for, uh, for wars in this part of the world as well. Um, that's another example. Um, but it's also made various promises. I think the North is increasingly aware that the problems of the global South do matter to it. Um, and um, in so far as it becomes increasingly aware, it's made uh, promises to aid more with the global South. So 
for instance, in terms of climate transition uh, support. But you know, those promises have been broken and not met in terms of support. Um, so I think that's where the North needs to change a little bit. But also the South, I think, also can do with some improvement. And I understand that the South does not want to choose between you know, various... The South great, is perfect. South the global doesn't require South, any improvement. The, glo the global South doesn't want to choose between uh, great power and great power competitions. It doesn't want to choose between uh, various uh, great powers. However, I think that should not be an excuse um, for failing to stand up for egregious breaches of the rule of law when that happens. So, so, so your, point, your point being that the Global South does not take uh, uh, principled positions that will enable it to further its own agenda. That's the, that's the point you're I making. think in order for the, the North and the South to meet, I think there needs to be movement on both sides. And in terms of the South's movement, I think that that can come about with greater regard for principles that support prosperity and security for all, including the Global South. So, uh, Dino, you've heard all of them. Uh, I think the point is, uh, A, I don't think any of them is too hope, uh, are being too hopeful here. Uh, Lynn was also talking about something that actually is steeped in Hippocratic, uh, or rather, hippo, uh, hypocrisies of the of the North, uh, and and then asking them to uh, adhere to principles that they themselves change depending on where the conflict is ra is raging, right? So it's very difficult. All of them basically say it's not happening. Uh, you are someone who's wiser than all of us here. Now, how do you see uh, the two meeting, uh, North and South, and and how what could trigger that? Well, um, I'm a former diplomat and best advice my father ever gave me was, look, when there's division, when you disagree with somebody, that's more the reason for you to talk to, mm -hmm. to, to the other side. And, and I hold that advice uh, dearly. And in Southeast Asia, uh, Indonesia and Singapore had sharp differences. We had confrontasi, Indonesia and Malaysia uh, also. But uh, we overcame with statesmanship and, and, and craft, uh, and now we have uh, the best of, of uh, relations. Uh, and I should say that Indonesia used to have uh, uh, a complex uh, about the North. Uh, I grew up in a generation that had sort of an inferiority complex, believing that the West had all the answers and that's where we want to go, mm -hmm. right? But I think one of the most important changes recently is that, look, the West doesn't have all the answers. In fact, we have some of the answers. Uh, and uh, the new thing that, that is uh, uh, quite uh, refreshing is the newfound confidence, mm -hmm. uh, which we mm -hmm. see in many countries in the Global South. And Confidence or overconfidence? Uh, uh, confidence. Confidence or overconfidence? I would say, uh, well, some are suffering from overconfidence, but, but there is uh, confidence based on achievements, mm -hmm. Uh, that, that uh, we're doing economic growth, uh, stability, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and I think uh, that is giving the world a different uh, texture. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in terms of North-South dialogue, uh, we have to admit there is such a thing going on in the G20 now, and I commend India uh, for bringing uh, African Union into that mix. Uh, and I think uh, it doesn't encompass the whole world, obviously, uh, but it does represent a, uh, a template of North-South dialogue, uh, which covers uh, really the most uh, uh, relevant economies. We're seeing also North-South dialogue in COP28 uh, taking uh, place now, right? Uh, and we hope, uh, so in next week, uh, and we hope that will uh, go well. Uh, the challenge, uh, is for the Global South. The non-aligned movement has lost steam. I'm sorry to say that. It's not as relevant today as, as it was before. Uh, but uh, fortunately, the G77 uh, has regained uh, uh, momentum, uh, especially after the meeting uh, in, in, in Cuba. Um, another format of North South relations that I find uh, working is in, in the regional context, uh, for example, in, in our part of the world, APEC is seen as a form of north-south dialogue uh, working on, on, on common goals. But just very quickly on, on, on conditions, I think, Shamir, uh, a forward-looking attitude uh, is very important uh, uh, between the north and, and, and the south. And I think, you know, we need to let go, uh, us in the south, of this blame game uh, and, you know, historical nostalgics uh, of uh, you know 
uh, colonialism or imperialism in the past. I mean, we've moved on from there, and if there is going to be a dialogue, it has to be on the basis of equality uh, and forward-looking attitude. How was how does the? I mean, let me ask you a more direct question. You know, in um, I think amongst the ASEAN, Singapore is the only country that has sanctioned Russia or joined the sanction regime against Russia yeah. amongst the ASEAN. Yeah. Um, how does that square up uh, uh, in in say regional uh, cooperation or regional dynamics when one country decides to partner with uh, uh, certain other nations and while the rest continue to have some sort of relationship? Yeah, well, uh, we're in ASEAN. Uh, we have the East Asia Summit. Uh, Russia is still a part of that and uh, Russians are represented in the East Asia Summit and Russia is still a dialogue partner of uh, ASEAN. Uh, and, and so nothing uh, has changed. Uh, per perhaps the conversation seems a bit more difficult. Uh, for Indonesia, as India experienced as well, managing the G G20 became very, very uh, tricky. Uh, but I think our experiences reflect the reality that, yes, uh, we do have these deep divisions between the G7, uh, the Western nations, and Russia, and uh, uh, with China as well. But uh, with the leadership and craft of India and Indonesia, we were able still to uh, produce a, a joint declaration that reflected movement on many of the global issues that we face. So I think uh, after the first round, we can safely say that G20 is where the North and South meet. I think that's the only place where they're really having a conversation on, on questions of uh, global concern. Uh, and I'm coming to you. Um, uh, maybe I can just throw, a, throw something into the mix as we move to the second round. Uh, what is the global South? And what is the global North? Uh, in, in what is it that defines? I have met countries in Europe that actually tell me that, you know, let's have a South-South partnership and the Southern European countries are actually uh, uh, wanting to uh, have a conversation with, uh, with the Global South on connectivity, on trade, on economic relations, on political adjustments. I'm not kidding. It's true. True story. You will hear about it if you come to Raisina next year. You're going to see some of those. So you see, you see many countries uh, believing themselves to be either part of the North or the South. But is there any easy definition? And does that complicate resolution? Uh, uh, Anthony, you wanted to come in. I'm going to bring you in. Yeah, can I take a step back and just reflect for one minute on the conversation so far? Mm -hmm. It seems to me that some people think, because we differ quite sharply about many global issues, let's find a way to talk together. Let's build the family. Let's create, you know, a coming together of minds. I'm very skeptical and doubtful if this is a strategy we ought to follow. Let's go to the G, let's take the AU to the G20. My question is, if we don't, or my point is, if we don't go to the negotiating table where we, where we will be confronted by a Davos man whose task it is to make sure that the global political economy works in favor of the West mm -hmm. and we don't do our homework and come prepared with positions, we will be co-opted. Mm -hmm. This is the danger. It has happened before, it will happen again. We enter a world of great power and regional power competition. Where do we put the emphasis? I say, let's turn inward for a moment as we face this rupture, this moment of, mm -hmm. of destabilization, and say to ourselves, in fact, in an earlier presentation at the opening of this um, conversation, President Becky said, what is the vision and the strategy that we want to design as a group who has volunteered to come together in Cape Town? There lies the answer. If we don't work out what it is that the global south needs to extract from the north in terms of climate change or peace and security or economics or better terms of trade, we shouldn't go there. Stay away. Uh, fair question, but again, let me start with you again. Let me ask you the question I just asked you. What is the global south? I agree. Let the south make a vision. I agree. But now, for example, when you go to uh, the climate negotiations, since they are now around the corner, you've seen that you will have a developing country position. The developing countries will be split into small island developing states. They will be split into uh, a, a block that would join with the defid of those who have been funded by DFID and UK Treasury. There would be a group that would uh, align with American positions because USAID has been active. There would be hurricane hit island states that would have been protected by certain other institutions who would join with them. The Germans would be giving favors. So my point here is, yes. uh, what is the Global South? Is Global South a shop where we come and rant? Yeah. 
or and just protest are we the global trade union or is there a delineation of what constitutes the south so that we could have a vision for the south yeah so so i used to say in the classroom that the global south uh, is those who belong to the oecd and the global that's the global north and the global south uh, is the g77 plus china but of course things are much more complicated and dynamic because nations move in and out mm -hmm. of categories mm -hmm. and strive to to join other alliances it seems to me that the the dna of brics used to be let's work together let's see where we have a common interest in mm -hmm. terms of the issues that you've mm -hmm. listed whether mm -hmm. it's climate change or terms of trade etc with the expansion of brics the dna becomes a bit tenuous or thin or stretched uh, or maybe contradictory what is the common set of values and principles that will bind the 11 or now it's 10 i, I can't <laughs> you can't we don't uh, know i'm yet. not too sure yeah. yeah or whatever the number is what is it that's going to make us to cohere as a significant actor in global politics that has a vision and a strategy to follow the answer is not easily to determine in fact when i was listening to the conversation earlier i thought out of this conversation we need to create a working group Mm -hmm. that will go and answer the question that some people ask over dinner as well why are our dreams broken mm -hmm. why have we failed our people okay. in the global south so let's let's put together an analysis that we can bring to this table next year that will give us the options that we need to pursue do you know do you want to come in on what is the global south well uh, we use the term developing countries uh, and uh, i mean to be honest uh, shamir Uh, I know President uh, Thabo uh, Mbeki today sp uh, spoke about the new world order that was uh, enunciated by the G77. And I totally agree with the, the importance of that. Uh, but my, my observation is that if you ask countries in the global south what they think about the world order, you get 130 different answers. <laughs> Right, and and I think that's going to be a problem in terms of how. So we, having a common vision is a challenge. I think it's not just a, a challenge. Getting these countries to actually collectively push for that vision to materialize is even harder. Challenge. And within Southeast Asia uh, itself, for example, just Southeast Asia, most of the countries are inward looking. Hmm. Right, and I think the same you can say in 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 South Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, right? And from experience, uh, we find that practically the biggest challenge is how these countries can come together and put a vision out for the world. Yes, and make it happen. And make it happen. Right. Okay, uh, Belina. Uh, thank you. I will concentrate only on the geopolitical side, and once again, I want to highlight that there could be a vision for the global south, and that would be. Once again, from a geopolitical point of view, to prevent another Cold War, because a Cold War 2.0 will be disastrous scenario for a collective global South. That means the countries from Latin America, from the African continent, from the Asian continent that are in between, being faced with another either or choice that they want, they don't want to make. Why? Because. as we've heard from the G20 summit development is actually top on the agenda and we know for a fact that once the polarization goes into the next stage because i argue that this rupture my colleague is talking about has just begun that we are maybe in a period of 15 20 years of ruptures and we know for a fact who is going to suffer the most it's not going to be the most developed part of uh, Uh, the global north and by the way the global north is also no longer coherent because one part of the collective west and that is mostly the old continent is suffering as well and i was actually thinking of saying this in the first session uh, in the first round that probably north and south will also meet somewhere in 10 15 years where part of the north becomes the new south Mm. and part of the south becomes the new north I, that's a very interesting question i'll come to that uh, i want to quickly go to lynn and final word to you for this round to elizabeth but lynn uh, your thoughts well i think the economists for instance would say that the global south are those you know who fall below a certain level of gdp or development um for me i am not clear what the global south is and i think you know i actually hadn't heard that term used as much as it is used 
now. Even earlier this year, um, in February, when I attended the Munich Security Conference, I was asked to speak about the Global South. And I actually had to Google the term because I had not heard it used at all in Southeast Asia. I'm not sure when India started using it. And actually the use of the term, I think, strikes me as being employed as a sort of convenient shorthand it's, um, by the North um, or the West to collectively group countries together that don't agree with its political positions. So the Global South is basically the part of the world that it needs to win over in terms of you know, condemning the Russian war in Ukraine, um, supporting its you know, stance against China, et cetera, et cetera. So I think you know, from that perspective, it's, it's less uh, an economic term, but more a political term for all those who haven't yet agreed with us. So there is less of an issue about, you know, um, because of levels of development, they move from north to south or so south to north. But, you know, if they change the political positioning, then perhaps they are now one of us. Just like Japan is part of the global north um, because it takes the same stance as the west. But I worry about this term because I think like the term, um, like, like the framing of democracies against authoritarian states, I think it risks dividing the world and entrenching the world into blocks, which is really what we do not need right now. And I think, you know, what we need is countries working together to resolve challenges and to put forward a more progressive view. What we do not need is um, blocks divided up. The sharpening and, of the divisions? Yeah, absolutely. Elizabeth, what is the South? Uh, do we really need it? I think that's yeah. the question Lynn no, is asking. I mean, is I, it useful to have the conception of the South? I think that's the point. I think, I think, I think the, the Global South is, 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 uh, is a complex uh, collective. Um, but I think it's, it's more than just sort of about the West uh, getting it to agree with it on, on political issues. I think the fundamental issue that we're talking about is that the Global South is an entity where a lot of the rules of the game uh, seriously disadvantage the abil its ability to develop, uh, its, its ability to, uh, to deal with some of its fundamental economic and socioeconomic challenges, and that the, the push, and, and I, I want to sort of, you, 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 you raised an issue about being concerned about the Global South being instrumentalized a little earlier. I think there has been a shift. I think there is a, a greater agency expressed both by Africa and by other developing countries that they're not going to be instrumentalized. But the, the point here is at what, uh, you, you know, you talked about crisis and rupture. And, you know, changes to the world order have emerged from wars. The question is, is that the way we're headed in order to create something that is hopefully fairer and more just, etc.? Or are there ways in which we can facilitate the change in the rules? And it's the rules from the international financial architecture to, well, climate finance, I see, is very much part of international financial architecture, to the way we... The trade. To trade, Correct. to IPR, okay. intellectual property rights, and so on. And for me, that is where the divisions come. And the divisions are there, unfortunately. So, you were, so I think, uh, let me try and paraphrase you, uh, and I'm taking the liberty of doing that while you're on stage. You're, you're making the point that those who have benefited from globalization at, as, as it exists today, uh, automatically tend to be the protectors of the system and part of the North, and those who seek changes so that they are able to so access the, the benefits the trade of, unions. Uh, 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 <laughs> are, are the South. Fair enough. So I think I'm paraphrasing you, but let, but let me leave it there. Okay, I'm going to bring you in, bring you all to the mic. Uh, Isabor and others who want to walk up, please come to the mic uh, on, the, on, on your left. I can see Lydia as well, and we're going to go to questions. Introduce yourself, short introduction. Absolutely. Uh, Amor Maklang, uh, Digital Filipinas, Digital ASEAN, and very proud to be part of the Global South. I think if there is one part, and I'm very happy to be represented by Indonesia on the table, if there's one area I think where the Global North needs to be part of the Global South is in the area of digital economies, specifically fintech. And uh, look at, for example, Indonesia and the Philippines. 
The fact that we are some of the most underbanked in the world has necessitated the global north to move a lot of its businesses and its development to serve the global south. So at the end of the day, when you follow the money, the money is going to be in ASEAN. 40% of the global GDP will be in our area. So I suppose they have no choice but to be part of the global south. Thank you very much. So that's a comment, more than a question, but I'll, I'll hear your response to that. Um, let me turn to you, Lydia. My question is for Anthony. Um, your comment about um, how civilizations could be the alternative to states was very provocative for me and I enjoyed it. Um, I am from the Global North and what I am noticing in the Global North is, is that people are no longer identifying as part of their country, uh, particularly the youth. They are identifying on civilizational issues such as climate change. I would like your thoughts on, on that and, and say, do you think that we are moving in that direction anyway with social media and all of that? So is, is the underpinning of civilizational states a deeper sense of identity, no longer existent in a world of Instagram and Insta chats? And we have, uh, uh, we have uh, attention spans of the problem for civilization states today. We just keep that thought with you. Please ask a question. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Kifen Zumkari. I am from the OR Tambo School of Leadership. Uh, first and foremost, I would like to perhaps uh, disagree a bit with the panelists on the first question that you posed to say, will the South, South, North, North ever meet? I think since the beginning of time, that meeting has been there, but uh, the power relations have not been fair. Uh, on the one hand, you have the North, which has been exploiting the global South. And on the other hand is the South, which has been on the receiving end. And maybe the more important question to have is to, is how do we change those power dynamics so that we can meet on an equal basis? Uh, now, my suggestion is two things. I think coming out of the BRIC summit, uh, there was a resolution that was taken that there's a need to reform the United Nations, particularly the Security Council. But I, think, I don't think that even the BRICS itself has done enough to conceptualize what that reform looks like, its form, its content, its character, mm -hmm. and the ideal outputs of that second particular point. reform. We the second point is that if we want to relate on an equal footing, we need to strengthen the non-state actors in okay. the global Civil South. Civil society of the group. Okay, Thank good. You. Sure. Look, I think both fair points. Please applaud him. Okay. I am going to pose the question to you. Look, Bricks, I think he raised a valid point. Let me ask you a question, final question, where all of you can then respond to the bunch of questions. The Bricks themselves, what have they done to reform the United Nations Security Council? You have two members who are, mem who are permanent, who are part of the permanent five. They don't want anyone else to come in. They are behaving like the North as well. How are they? I mean, how is China South? If China is defending its position in the UN Security Council and is not willing to allow, say, the South Africans or the Indians or the Brazilians to participate in that. So, are we really, is the North-South battle a power struggle, a battle for power and relevance without really changing the system, only replacing those who are sitting on the throne with newcomers? Or is there a more ethical, moral underpinning in the Southern debates? I think that's the point uh, the gentleman just posed to all of you. So, I'm going to go, uh, I'm going to use the order of sitting, seating, and I'm going to start with Anthony. You had a question to you, especially on the civilization state, yeah. but you can answer others as well, and then we're going to come down to Belina as there. I, the, the quest to reform the UN Security Council has been going on for decades. An opportunity arose when BRICS tackled the issue. But if Russia and China do not allow any other BRICS member, never mind a founding member, to join a reformed Security Council, the quest is dead. We should focus elsewhere. Which is, I'm coming back to an earlier point. If we want to engage the West to change the rules of the game, we have to get the house in order and go with strategies that we here in Cape Town can begin to develop in cooperation with many others across the global south. Um, otherwise, I don't think uh, we will win this game. And what about uh, the point, very interesting point. Why are we not using the power of our civil society, young people, uh, large populations to shape the discourse? Why are we not including that in statecraft? 
the West does it very well. The northern countries have used their NGOs and think tanks and academic institutions to further their agenda. Do we I, do it enough? I, I wanted to say earlier in the first round, but uh, you're a stickler for time, so I couldn't say that. But I'll say it now. Um, I admire what BRICS has achieved. In fact, the BRICS summit in, in Santon a couple of months ago was a resounding success for those who participated. But it's a state-driven process, isn't it? And so I acknowledge the role that the organizers played in bringing the private sector, uh, various formations of, of civil society into the room, so to speak. But they were really on the margins and after hours, but like this conversation now, where interesting ideas are developed, but it's not institutionalized. I see a role for civil society being institutional, an assembly of the citizens to participate in BRICS summits. Okay. Um, on the question of civilization states, there are ancient states who have developed political philosophies that offer its citizens a vision of the future, of how to organize political society that is not threatening to others, that can be inclusive, that transcends religion, race, and class. That is the quest I think we need to explore if we want to say that let's negotiate and enter into dialogues with the West. Thank you. Elin, let me turn to you. I think the comment about whether, or rather that the comment that BRICS hasn't done enough, I think showcases or underscores um, something that we have very much assumed on this uh, panel, which is the unity of the global south. And of course it isn't unified. They have countries in the global south have uh, different um, perceptions of threat, different challenges, different interests. And we see that in BRICS with you know, India and China and in terms of their very different interests and their, in a sense, competition to lead the global south and the different sort of approaches they take towards leading the global south. I think the other thing as well about um, the, the point about UN security reform is that it also highlights how, you know, the global south does need to work with the global now, north. Now, we, if we, we are talking about reform of the UN Security Council, you need the leading powers in the world to support this. And number one amongst this is the United States. And in fact, the United States has come forward to support inclusion of more permanent and non-permanent members of the United Se Nations Security Council. So I, I do not want to be too simplistic in kind of dichotomizing north and south. Um, because, you know, cooperation between the two is necessary. And if we tear up the rule book, then there's going to be competition over whose rules matter as well. And so I'm not sure that that's the so answer Elizabeth, either. The U.S. has done more to try and accommodate new members than many of your and our partners in the BRICS. How do you, how does that square up with solidarity or a common vision for the world emerging from the South? Well, it, it speaks to the issue that we talked about earlier, which is about national interests. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you are in the pound seat, you don't want to give it up. Mm -hmm. And you certainly don't want to dilute it. Mm -hmm. Unless in the process of diluting the, the arrangement, your own power uh, increases, I think. So that's what we see with the UN Security Council. But there's a lot, been a lot of focus on UN Security Council as a key element of reform, but I think there are also other areas Correct. where the BRICS certainly has have pushed. Like the bank, the new and development the bank. bank. And, and I think that's an interesting development, and it goes back to the issue of agency, that we've pushed on reforms inside the system, the existing system, but when that hasn't happened quickly enough, or at we've, built an spot, alternative. we've looked at alternatives outside. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is, the, is potentially the tipping point. That at some point, I think the global north, or the west, will also realize that <coughs> we are not going to they have a lot to lose if they actually don't come to the party. And I think a lot of the uh, announcements that have been made by, by sort of countries in, in, uh, of the P5, not China and Russia, around supporting uh, change is, I think, partly a reaction to that. Um, mm -hmm. And at some point, if they don't move quickly enough, I think that whole system will be You could see the breakdown of the Security Council completely. Yeah. And just one large, last point on the African Union and the G20. I think the importance of vision and strategy and priorities is so critical. I think the first step and the smallest step uh, is that, when, that the AU is now a member. The next thing is we really need to put effort into determining and, and working out technical support, priorities, and so on, and how we're going to articulate them effectively and influence the grouping in a way that the outcomes, both the agenda setting and the outcomes, mm -hmm. are to our benefit. Otherwise, it becomes a, 
And it's a symbolic, it's a symbolic addition. How do you make them gainful actors? I think that's yeah. the point that you're making. Fair enough. Uh, Dinu, your final thoughts? Yes, um, I, I wanted to... Uh, sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Okay. Uh, uh, I just remember. So, um, the gentleman mentioned about uh, equality. Uh, and look, uh, my organization, we did some research on, on declarations produced by the North and the South. We found something interesting that is in the declarations of most countries in the South, there are four key words that are found that are usually not found in political statements of the North, right? What they are, interestingly, one is equality, right? Mm -hmm. Second, non-intervention, mm -hmm. right? You would agree with that. Third is uh, inclusion, mm -hmm. right? And fourth is mutual respect, right? It sounds like, oh, you know, it's cliche. No, no, no. Uh, the, the reason why mutual respect is, is a coded word for countries in the South is because we usually think that the North look down on us a lot, which is why we always say equality and mutual respect, right? And I think uh, the more these narratives are used by the South in global countries, conversations, uh, the better. And another quick point, uh, the point about civil society. Uh, uh, my organization, working with ORF, uh, we've done uh, this uh, gro online global town hall, right? And the idea is to have uh, east, west, north, south dialogue of civil societies, right? Uh, and this year we had about 151 countries uh, taking part. And the biggest revelation is a lot of the countries that join us from countries in South, uh, sorry, Africa, uh, Latin America, and so on, the one that we called up, they said, hey, no one ever called us before, and we don't feel like we're part of any global conversations. And they were very glad to join the online global town hall. But the point is we have to do a lot of work, Lots really. Uh, and, uh, and we must applaud uh, Dino's organization because it is absolutely obsessed on bringing young voices, youth voices, making them the hosts, giving them in charge of the agenda, setting people, you know, young people run that conference, must participate, do join us online next year. Uh, when uh, Dino calls us again, I think he has something coming up again, a different uh, seminar soon, but please follow him. Belina, final word. Um, Albert uh, Einstein once said uh, that problems cannot be so solved at the level of awareness that has created them. Mm. And right now we need to move towards new level of awareness and mm -hmm. we see already a lot of push, mm -hmm. a lot of efforts in various fields. Some of the fields were mentioned. Uh, that is the good news. Now, let me go back to the bad news. And the bad news is that the three key players in, responsible for this global order, which are United States, China and Russia, have little to zero interest in change. In change. Mm. Um, we see on the side of the United States how actually America is trying and struggling to preserve uh, what has been, you know, uh, gained a and regained. Absolutely. And is uh, looking for new allies, looking for new partnerships. Um, most of them will probably happen in the Indo-Pacific region. This is actually the good case for the ASEAN, where the biggest economic growth will happen, well, second biggest uh, demographic change, positive change will happen next to the biggest positive demographic change that will happen on the African continent. And Russia and China creating their own rules of the game. And this is also a reality we need to understand and perceive and try to develop agency against. So my warning is that in this bifurcating, uh, bifurcated world, in which we see a lot of disentanglement in all relevant socioeconomic networks, next to the hurting of the planet, next to actually the biggest challenges linked to the, to the Earth, to the planet Earth, we are going to see a lot of earthquakes, a lot of uh, migrations actually caused because of climate and not so much because of industrial activity. And all of this happening in the most exciting period of a fourth industrial revolution, whereas the African continent has been deprived of capitali capitalizing on the previous three waves of the industrial revolution. My point is that uh, understanding the systemic objective systemic processes is rule number one 
for survival. And moving away from this, creating a new level of awareness is how actually agencies will happen. It will be an outcome of objective processes, but the next thing that will have to happen is a lot of effort from institutions, political decision makers, and society in the so-called Global South to collectively steer new processes, okay. create new narratives, and actually uh, have their own stake in the game. So, so, uh, so final, uh, just a final word, because I think it's very important. We are just at the beginning of all these changes. We are going to see new currencies. We are going to see new digital, uh, you know, uh, digitalization of a scale that we haven't uh, f f foreseen. We are going to see new economic paradigms. We are going to see new trade uh, alliances. All of this is going to happen in the next years. Probably next time when we are sitting, we are going to already discuss some of these things happening. And that means that not all of these negative changes that are happening actually are going to produce only negative outcome, on the mm. opposite. So here, I mean Okay, so I, 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 I'll, I'll interrupt you. Uh, her point, very simple, disruption can be positive. Let's try to find the positive outcomes. Dino uh, makes a strong case for dialogue and conversations. Uh, uh, their own experience tells you that talking to each other helps in finding solutions. Uh, Elizabeth has warned you that if you don't change, we will create something different. Uh, she has given you the example of the new development bank because the veteran group is failing and we could have new security architectures mushrooming and the decentralization of security from the UNSC could be dangerous for the north and for the south. I think that's the point uh, Elizabeth was making. Uh, Lynn is uh, in, in many ways uh, making a plea for the south to, uh, to uh, rethink the principles and the, and the rationale that they seek in the world of the future and to take positions that are consistent and not opportunistic don't behave like the North is what she is saying. If South has something different, it must be something more, more moral. Uh, and of course, I like the final point that Anthony never made. So I'm going to make it for him. I think he said some, he teased us with this idea of, of uh, political theories and political frameworks and, and political structures emanating from the South, emanating from old civilizations, uh, emanating from countries that may be young, but are peoples that have been here forever. And I think that is the final point I want you to start thinking about. I think the idea that democracy is Western is rubbish. The idea that liberalism is Western is also rubbish. Uh, the, the ancient societies in many parts of what is now called the Global South were far more liberal, had gender empowerment that the West only saw in the 20th century, had pluralism uh, that held their leaders to account, which still is not, which still sees Donald Trump running for president. So the point that we are making is that let's, let's try and de delve deep into our own histories. And perhaps histories don't repeat themselves, but they certainly rhyme. We may find the answer a little back in our own experiences. Let's dig them out, let's put them out, let's cr chronicle them, let's share them. Let's build a political culture that is more organic. Please join me in applauding them for their wonderful interventions. Thank you very much.